Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey guys, on today's session, we talk with Amy Marcotte. Amy is a veteran and she has a pretty interesting history. We talk a lot about her caretaking parts and her intellectualizing parts and how they get in the way of sessions sometimes. We talk a little bit about unblending and letting the self lead. She helps me with an issue around parenting, which was incredibly insightful. For those of you who want to know a little bit more about Amy and how she's doing after this podcast, I thought you'd be curious to know that she's been out exploring the world. She just got back from Australia. So here's Amy. I hope you enjoy her as much as I did. Okay, well, I'm super excited to have Amy Marcotte joining me today. Amy is one of my buddies from IFS. Hey, Tammy. So I just want to tell everybody a little bit about you before we get started. You have done level one and two level twos. Mm-hmm. Them was the intimacy from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And you are certified. I am. As an IFS practitioner. Yes. And you are um, in Maine at the, you're at the director of the Sanford Vet Center. Have you been doing that? I've, I've been at the Sanford Vet Center since 2000. So there are dust there are little dust bunnies running around that place that are about the same age as <laughs> the tenure that I've been there. Good to know. You have dust bunnies at your house that have been there that long? Oh Lord, sadly. Now I was owning up to the ones at my office, Tammy, but the ones at my house, well <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> And you work primarily with veterans. Right that who have had exposure to war zone trauma and have suffered military sexual abuse. Exactly. Yep. Wow. Um, we work entirely with a population of folks that have experienced some sort of trauma or been exposed to it. And you are a veteran. I am. I was uh, in the army from 1992 to 1996 and was a social worker in the military. And I did two years with the 10th Mountain Division and deployed to Somalia and Haiti with them. Um, And then I did my last two years at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. And I worked with um, victims of family domestic abuse. And then I did community mental health. Wow. So you've done a lot of challenging things. Yeah. my My whole career has been working with either the military or veterans. And when did you start working with IFS? I was first introduced to IFS in probably 2010 or 11. I had a couple of buddies that had gone to a level one training somewhere along the lines and they came back all excited about it and shared their experience about it, but I had no earthly idea what they were talking about. (laughs) It was so divergent from what I was used to. Um, And so I thought it was really cool that they were so enthused, but I didn't really pursue it much further uh, at that time. And then in 2013, I uh, went to a retreat that Dick had done at the Kripalu uh, Retreat Center out in Western Massachusetts. I thought I was pretty clever on that one because I hoodwinked my boss into sending me to this IFS training, which I thought was going to be some guy just doing PowerPoint presentations about this model that he had and that I was just going to, you know, sit and put up with that and then enjoy the facility. Yeah. (laughs) And of course the, you know, the, within the first 10 minutes of um, hearing Dick talk about um, the model and seeing him use it and then experiencing how that felt in my system a little bit um, that I was able to explore. I could, I could feel a shift just from that experience Really, it really started making sense to me why my compadres were so um, excited about the model. And so from there, I was very interested in getting a level one training uh, on the road. So um, yeah, so I, I thought I was being clever. 
my, myself into something totally wonderful and it's been life changing. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing that it was like within 10 minutes that you were listening and just experiencing that and within 10 minutes you could you could feel something different. Yeah. And what what do you remember that difference being or feeling? I don't know that I can tell you exactly what it was, but I can tell you what I what it likely was. What I, I love about IFS is that it's so um, deep pathologizing, right? It's like, you, you know, it's really the understanding that all of the intense things that we do and all of the wackadoodle ideas that we come up with and all of the things that we've done to try to just cope with life and um, exist in the world, it's all designed, those parts of us are just designed to try to I mean, that out of the gate, that's what he was talking about. And I had had my own uh, readjustment uh, difficulties coming out of the military and um, some of the things that I had experienced there and then hadn't gotten any sort of therapy whatsoever um, when I got home. I was the caretaker, right? And I wasn't, I was not supposed to have any problems myself says a part. Yeah, right. <laughs> says your caretaking part. Caretaking part. <laughs> so um, as you can imagine, my jerry rig duct, duct tape attempt at trying to readjust and carry my burdens really didn't work out functionally all the time mm -hmm. um, in terms of the way I was existing in my family. My own self-care really took a, a back seat. And um, so there were a lot of things that, uh, you know, was just so suffering. And so any, anyways, when I was uh, exposed to um, IFS at Kripalu, it really, my, my parts felt seen, right? And they felt hopeful that there would be something that I would be able to do to really explore, you know, some of the things that I have done through my life that um, I've had shame about, or I've you know got, had critical parts, you know, get riding my tail end about them, or and really be able to work towards healing, you know, just some really overly burdened, exiled parts that um, had not had any TLC. So, boy, that's a long-winded answer to your question, Tammy. But it was great, and there's there's so much there. I really appreciate. You sharing that and opening up a little bit about that i was thinking as you talked that sounds like a huge shift from going from caretaking to realizing that your parts needed to be seen and wanted you to see them that had to be pretty different for you it was very different for me i you know i have really been be, been able to understand and appreciate how Parts of me, my therapist parts, my caretaking parts, those are very dominant parts in my system. And they really, really liked the army mentality of suck it up and drive on. Oh, wow. Okay. You need to just be tough and self-reliant and um, that your focus is on taking care of other people so that they can stay in the mission. And then, of course, as a therapist, I had a therapy, you know, a cadre of therapist parts that really kind of interpreted being a therapist as being self-sacrificing and putting other people's needs first and those kinds of things. That was just, that was running my system into the ground, right? It's just, yeah. Yeah. So those parts of me were exhausted. They were utterly exhausted. And for them to just be able to, first of all, let me know all of the things that they've been doing on my behalf was huge for them. But it's been such a relief that they don't have to strive, especially in the office and in my life in general. So, and what a difference that has made the idea that like um, you were running on these parts exhausted. Now they don't have to strive anymore, but you're still functioning. <laughs> Maybe opinions vary. But <laughs> I think that's largely true. You function better or differently, I'm guessing. I am honestly not sure if I would still be able to be in my job right now if I hadn't have had this shift. I was really burned out. Um, I can remember in my level one training, um, I showed my, my group, my class, that I had on my phone a running 
right? Uh, that was counting down to the day that I could retire. On your phone all the time. On my phone all the time because I just... I was, my, my, my parts were so exhausted to be able, I don't have that timer, right? And, you know, not that there aren't days that aren't tough and don't tweak those parts, you know, and get their attention. And, um, you know, I certainly have a part every now and then that fantasizes about, you know, being pin, pink slipped or uh, sending in a letter of resignation <laughs> when the bureaucracy gets to me. Um, but what it has, what IFS has done for me is to be able to um, understand when I'm with a client who tends to show up and try to run a good therapy session for me through the trainings and my own therapy and my own consultation. I've really gotten to know those parts and like what it is that they're trying to do to what they're trying to bring into my life, which is generally a sense of control. Yeah, or a sense of um, being esteemed by others, looking competent and capable. Perhaps the biggest change for me, um, which is related to my military service, one of the traumas that I experienced in the, in the military was when I was deployed to Haiti. I, I was responsible to, um, for a, a large group of soldiers. And to make a long story short, we had a couple of suicides in the the unit that I was responsible for and there in true government fashion was finger pointing in terms of the cause. And of course I kind of got in the way of I, some of those fingers were pointed at me. So at any rate, what I, what I was burdened with is just parts that would get really, really anxious when clients would come in with parts that were advocating for suicide to avoid stuff. And so I would get into those pissing contests with my clients around my paternalistic want to protect them and to tell them what to do, which of yeah. course was countered by, you know, all kinds of different things, but largely digging in of heels and uncooperativeness and all the things that we can expect when people start bossing you around and disempowering you. <laughs> so doing my own work and really kind of um, following that little path to learning about how my system was organi organized around helping me cope with suicidal clients has helped me be able to be self more self-led with my clients so mm -hmm. that I can appreciate that those are parts of them that are, yeah. are suggesting that and then help them get in relationship with that part. And it's taken the responsibility off of my shoulders, you know, so that's been a huge relief, right? It's just that not feeling like I have to be the end all and be all in, in those sessions and that um, I'm just facilitating relationship. So, I mean, that, because if you're coming, if your caretaker part of you is driving the bus, and then you are going to be responsible for this person in front of you who has a part of them that wants to kill themselves, um, it makes sense that if your caregiver part is running the ship all the time, that ship is going to sink. Absolutely right. Yeah, my caregiver part, you know, part of strategy is to foster a dependency Mm. right like yes. to have somebody know fully well that they can count on me to protect them right and that's a setup for both the client and for me of course right yeah and um it's 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 a it's a bad contract <laughs> for sure yeah that writing <laughs> that that part of me was writing well it sounds like that that part of you was even writing it for your own system that like the multiple multiple in you, the caregiver and the one that wants to be protected and knows that that's actually happening inside of you. So it's not only is it happening outside, taking other people, but it's also happening inside within your parts. Oh, absolutely. And as much as the caregiver, um, the caretaking part, you know, it has an, it, it does its job kind of externally, you know, it, 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 it does all of the, you know, the, safety planning and the refer all this all this business right as much as that's how those are the behaviors its interest is really internal right yeah it really is for to develop some sense of control over a chaotic and uncontrollable situation yeah and to just really make something less scary for that part of me that really was shamed by mm -hmm. being 
told that she was responsible for something that she just could not have been responsible for. Yeah, and that what a different way, I think, that IFS looks at that is that we aren't just looking at external, that, that we really are looking at how that works inside of us. And I think that is just such a different model and world, it's a worldview shift. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, I think that there's some, you know, in the therapist community, in our tradition, there, you know, there's always been the encouragement of us therapists to be aware internally of, you know, transference and counter-transference and, you know, what are, what are our biases and those kinds of things. But IFS really has provided a way to really understand that more deeply, that it, that there are obviously more than one protective strategy, one, more than one. I have a cadre of therapist parts. <laughs> yes. right? They are skilled and they're wicked smart. And, <laughs> yes. You know, they're eager beavers. Yes. And, um, but they don't run a therapy session. They, they just, they don't facilitate a, a therapy session like I can when I do it right? They all have a piece of the pie and they make great consultants, but by really, um, and, and really at the end of the day, they don't like the responsibility of being in charge of the sessions because it's overwhelming. The relationship that I've kind of worked at developing with my cadre is one of, um, listening to them, right? They have great ideas in a session, I may have to say, listen, that's a great idea, but let me come back to you on that. Let me, let me stay in the seat. You know, can you, can you relax? And they oftentimes will, as long as I'm good at spending that time later. Yeah. With them and really hearing them out and understand why they're reacting the way they're reacting. You said earlier about being self-led and then this idea of when they let me or that, that when I am running. So when you say that, that idea of let me do it, tell me about what that means. Yeah. So when I, so one of my therapist parts that, that is really eager, she's one of my more eager beaver, um, ready Freddy parts is a part that wants to say things just right and wants to be very eloquent and articulate, uh, and interpret things a little bit and educate the client. And so, you know, when she has kind of uh, blended with me and is is the one holding the microphone. What ends up happening is the client and I have a pretty heady intellectual discussion about something. She is usually pretty spot on in terms of what it is that she wants to teach and the observations that she makes. It's not that that part of me is wrong. It's just that when she leads, first of all, I'm doing a lot of talking. And yeah. it's not. So that's always, you know, a, a physics issue in a therapy session. But th- the other thing is, is I'm not, I'm not helping the client be in relationship to the part, the target part or this, the protector that is trying to do something. I'm not letting that, that person hear from their own part, what their story is. And mm. that part will tend to be, you know, um, striving towards an understanding versus letting it organically happen by help letting me from self help the client have some self to part time, right? Some one-on-one time and facilitating that kind of bonding. Yeah, that's great. It's almost like the part of you in your head is hanging out with a part of them in their head and you guys are just having a lovely time. Exactly. It's the collusion of the intellectual parts. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can so appreciate sometimes. I also noticed that, you know, sometimes I have a part that, you know, it's kind of a cheerleader part, you know, and will and and kind of eggs this other smart part on, right? And we'll say, that was really good. I really like how you said that. You should say it more like that, you know? And so there's these tells that I've gotten used to. Oh, um, I love that. Okay. That, that are real because these, these parts have been on the job for me since I've become a social worker, right? These are like the Grand Canyon donkeys, right? They've been up and down into the therapeutic canyon a million times, right? And it's been road hard and put away wet, these poor parts of mine. And 
<laughs> and so, you know, um, for them to be able to, to give me a, a little bit more latitude um, to lead in the sessions, and they could see that clients actually calmer and um, were healing and um, were actually less needy, you know, if wow. we're able to terminate sooner with clients because they were doing better. Once they could see that, you know, letting me lead was effective, they gave me more and more space and they are really not feeling burdened by the job that they have to do, at least for the most part. I mean, obviously there's going to be things that I'll forever have to work with my parts on, you know, um, but at any rate, it's been a big relief to them to not have to be the guy in charge. Well, and I like that what you said about that you have these tells. And so, you know, it sounds like when you're in a part, you know what it sounds like, it feels like in your body when a part is doing something instead of self doing it. Right. I don't know if I'm if I saying that right or how would you? No, I think that's just right, Tammy. And it, But it's, I think, um, before I got myself distracted with my Grand Canyon um, metaphor, <laughs> um, you know, where I was going with that is that it's really subtle in terms of when those therapist parts kind of take over in a session. And because for the longest part, that was my, that was my presentation in my sessions. That's who was in charge. Yes, right. And it's yeah. just been in the last, you know, five or six years since I've been practicing IFS that I know the difference. And it's very, it's very subtle. Sometimes it's a matter of noticing that, you know, I'm kind of like wrinkling my forehead a little bit and I'm striving to understand something, right? Or, you know, uh, I could be a goofball. And so sometimes I'll have a part that um, will try to join with a client by being silly or, you know, humorous and that sort of thing. And, um, which, you know, I'm not pathologizing that at all, but you can't spend a whole session, you know, joking around. They, they don't pay you for that. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that. I think that's something that is that we, to be aware of that, to be aware of what it feels like, what it sounds like. And even noticing that furrowed brow is if I'm furrowing my brow, then I know that another part or parts taken over me. And it sounds like you have a really good way of asking those parts to relax. And then you've done a, such a good job of having a relationship with your parts. Yeah. And oftentimes, um, you know, I will say something to the effect, because of course in a session, you don't have a lot of time to, to check in with your parts, although it's perfectly okay to like pause for just a second. Say, you know, and, and I can let my clients know I've got a part that's interrupting right now. And I gotta, I've just got to check in with it, right? So sometimes, you, but largely it's just really quick. Most of the time what I'll say is, you know, you remember this, that this goes better when I'm the one doing, you know, the, the talking, when I'm the one present with the, the vets. Is there something you really have to tell me right now? Or can you just step back? Mm. Talking to someone who comes up and interrupts you, you would say, hey, um, I'm actually trying to talk to somebody else. Right. <laughs> so can you wait a second? I like to do this thing where I ask you to look out a window. Listeners are just, they're not getting to see you. They're just listening to you. So just to kind of orient that time in place, if you could look out a window, what would you see? Could you just describe what you would see out your nearest window? Well, because I live in Maine, I am looking outside to my front yard and I can see the silhouette of my bird feeder that is usually a flutter with activity. And I can see across the street to my neighbors who have really beautiful Christmas candles out. Oh, that sounds lovely. Do you have bird seed in your bird feeder? Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, my wife just filled it for the birds for tomorrow. <laughs> Part of me feels so guilty when I look out and there's no bird seed in the bird feeder. <laughs> So I have a segment that I like to call IRL, which is means in real life. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example or sort of an, an issue that I'm having. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me a little bit about what you think is happening, you know, kind of putting your IFS glasses on. And I want us to sort of explore really briefly this issue that I'm having, having through IFS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Almost like your dear Abby. But your dear Abby with IFS explanation. Okay. Well, lay it on me, Tammy. We'll see how this rolls. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> My son, he's in second grade and he, uh, they have like um, cards that they flip. So he starts the day on, on green. And then, you know, if he's naughty in some way, he gets to yellow. You know, then if he's more naughty, he gets to red. So I guess today for the first time, he was quite naughty for him as being very silly. So apparently he was like maybe making faces and doing some telescopy sort of thing, just very silly and cute. But his teacher maybe doesn't want that part of him to be so present at school, wants his student part to be present. So anyways, he's on red. So here's my dilemma. I feel like I should give him some sort of consequence for that, but he, I know, is tired and we were away this weekend. He said to me on the way home, but I just got back to school and I said something like, and I wasn't sure what to do or something. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I guess my dilemma is, you know, I want to give him a consequence and I don't really want to get, he's already going to have a consequence. And I kind of feel like uncomfortable. And I guess maybe I don't know. It feels a little bit confusing to me. So what I'm, understanding about that and so correct me if any of this is wrong or fictional <laughs> what I'm understanding is that you've got kind of um, two teams right now that are kind of activated you've got a team of protectors that wanting to um, make sure that your son understands the repercussions of the naughty behavior and want him maybe um, want there to be some repercussions and there's another encampment of parts that um, don't necessarily agree with that kind of realize that there may be some extenuating cir circumstances and are kind of advocating uh, for him is that is that right yeah that sounds exactly right yeah and there may be a part that's kind of come in with some confusion around that or kind of the stalemate is causing confusion yeah, I think it feels like that way. It's sort of like the stalemates or the two camps and the, having a stalemate. That is what kind of brings the confusion. But as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, yeah, one of the teams is saying to me, well, if you were a good mom, you would, you know, have an appropriate consequence. That's what a good mom would do. Wow. <sighs> and I wasn't even realizing that until you started saying that. I'm like, oh, I've got this over here. It's like, oh, a good mom should do this. Great. So that's that's a deepening of your kind of understanding of what motivates that that part to 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 want to have some circumstances or some uh, repercussions to his behavior. And if you were to spend a little time on the other side of the fence with the other encampment, what would they tell you their motivation is? Mm, that's a really good question. In extreme, their motivation is not to have a conflict with him and not to tell him he can't have screens or because then that he's going to have a conflict. So he, him and I will then have a conflict. I don't want to have a con. I don't want to fight with him. When you end up in conflict with him, what ends up happening inside of you? Um, that's a really good, okay. What happens inside of me when I have a conflict with him? I feel very sad. I think it really triggers a part that needs to um, not have any conflict with anyone ever. <laughs> wow, okay. I, my, my first thought when you said that was, I don't have conflict with people, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to insinuate? I know. What is this thing called conflict? <laughs> so this, this part in this camp, encampment here works really hard to help you avoid conflict because it, when you have conflict, a very rare occasion, uh, I'll, I'll uh, admit. <laughs> it causes it causes sadness and maybe some some other vulnerability, and it really doesn't want that for you. Yeah, and actually, just really seeing that that's actually really helpful. That idea. Okay, I just had this thought of like, wow, how fast, how fast that went to a deep place. See how one side is saying like, this is what a good mom should do, and I could spend a lot of time on that on that on this side um is avoiding conflict that is and i could spend a lot of time there so thank you for that amy that was like Ooh. yeah yeah and i think that's what ifs can do right with something pretty simple as well i just got to know two parts of or two sort of sides of me right 
when I came up with this idea, I wasn't even thinking something like that could happen. Yeah. Well, beautiful. Thanks for letting me, thanks for letting me help you with that. So I'm going to end with this, Amy. That was really helpful, but I'm going to end with this. Okay. If you were not a therapist, mm-hmm. be anything you wanted to be or do anything you wanted to do, what would you do? Oh, I would explore the world. I would just be out traveling and, and seeing new things and meeting new people and just connecting with people around the world. That's, mm. that's my fantasy. That's a beautiful fantasy. And what's amazing is that you already do that in so many ways. Okay, on a larger scale. <laughs> yeah, I okay. I have a part that just really likes to explore and have adventures and that sort of thing. And I want to give her, you know, a little bit more free reign after retirement. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate it. No sweat, Tammy. Really fun. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.